We are creatures who struggle with hate and loathing and envy and greed and anger. And so often, like Joseph's brothers, we allow these feelings to cloud our minds and dominate our motivations. But you, Holy One, you are able to work through the anger. You help us transform that anger and help us find peace. And you, beloved Mother God, you let us face the world receptive to our feelings and those of others. So help us take in these feelings of tragedy and betrayal and hope and longing and joy that we encounter with a full heart. Let us not close off our feelings to the world, but help us embrace them. Help us to feel anger and then let us embrace our empathy or sadness. Be with us, Holy One, as we weep in heartbreak and find hope in all that we encounter. Let us not shy away from our feelings of judgment, but help us embrace them so that we can turn these feelings into moments of redemption, moments where you, Blessed Mother, can do something for good. We give thanks to you each and every day. And in your holy name we pray. Amen. come together across the distances between us in prayer. Holy One, we know all about sackcloth and ashes these days. We know what it feels like to mourn and to ache, to weep, worry, and wonder about what will happen to our loved ones, to this nation, and to ourselves. So we pray that you, who bring beauty out of ashes, you who creates us ashes to ashes and dust to dust would make of our ashen ways into the way of resurrection. Help us to practice resurrection hope today that our worry might be held in your compassion 
that our weeping might be met with the companionship of Jesus's own tears, and that our wondering about the future might fade into the background of Jesus reminding us in gentle tones of your ever-present abiding care. In feast and in famine, we are your people, God. In calm and in crisis, we are your people, God. Forgive within us what needs your forgiveness today and help us to live as your people in your holy name. The risen Lord has given us a green and growing hope and makes of us a people whose name is love, whose song is alleluia, and whose sign is peace. We are forgiven. Hear the sound of love poured out. O Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall declare your praise. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Amen. Amen. time for the message for young disciples. So today we're going to talk about Joseph, the story of Joseph. And this is not Joseph, the father of Jesus. This is not Mary's husband. This is a Joseph that came way before, a long time before in the Bible. So the story of Joseph, Joseph's father, his name was Jacob. And Jacob had a ton of sons. And Joseph was one of the youngest. He was the second to youngest. And so Joseph had a lot of older brothers. And in the family, everybody said that Joseph was um, Jacob's favorite. So he, they said, oh, Joseph is dad's favorite, which is not really true. Parents don't have favorite kids, but in that family, that's what the brothers said. And as they grew up, the brothers ended up doing pretty annoying and mean things to Joseph because they were jealous of him. So at one point, they even kicked him out of the family and, and off their land, which was a pretty mean thing to do. Fast forward. So Joseph kind of spent a lot of his life away from his family because his brothers kicked him out and they were really mean to him. And then one day, the brothers needed help their land had no food on it. And so they went to Joseph and they asked him for help. They didn't even recognize him at first because he had grown up and he was off in another land and he was wearing different clothes. Um, and he was in a position of power where he could actually help them if he wanted to. So they went to him and they really pleaded. And Joseph had to do a lot of, of searching inside himself in order to forgive them but ultimately he forgave them and helped them and they recognized that this was their brother who they were been super mean to. So we're gonna just learn a little lesson that's gonna help us um, connect this story to our virtue of the month, which is awe. Now Joseph's brothers were really jealous of them. Have you guys ever heard that word jealous? It's when you see someone else who has something that you want and that could be like they're better at a sport than you or they have a cool lunchbox or backpack or clothes um, or they seem to be like the teacher's favorite or the coach's favorite and you start to get a little bit angry and upset because you're, you think that they're better than you in some way and that makes you upset. And this is something that we all feel in our lives because we start to worry that we're not good enough, that somebody else is better than us. 
Um, and that's not true, but we all feel it. So it's very normal to feel and it just takes working with a little bit. So when this happens to you, and this is how Joseph's brothers felt, right? They were really jealous of him because he was dad's favorite and they ended up being really mean to him. So when you feel jealousy, maybe you can think of a time when that happened to you. Instead of feeling like you want to think mean thoughts about the person, it's time to get curious about what is actually good about the person. What can I focus on that I can really appreciate in the other person? What can I focus on that's really good about the other person? And practicing the things in them that are beautiful. And this is awe, right? It's our virtue of the month. It's when we see something and we think, oh, wow, that's really cool. or That's really beautiful. So the next time this happens to you, you can just take a moment. You can close your eyes or take a deep breath and say, okay, instead of thinking mean thoughts, let me ask myself, what is there about this person that I can feel like, oh, wow, that's really cool and that's really beautiful. That's something really beautiful about them. So let's have a prayer. Dear God, please help us to know that we are enough. We are always good enough just as we are and to look at other people with kindness and respect and be curious about what is good about them. Amen. All right, have a great week, everyone. Let us pray. Holy One present with us now, in the midst of these truly turbulent times, calm our spirits, open our hearts to receive your word. Where we need to be comforted, bring your solace. But don't stop there. Where we need to be challenged, provoked, moved to action, stir us out of complacency. Bless the preacher now in preaching, and us in our listening, and our response. In Jesus' name, amen.
Receive now God's word for us from Genesis chapters 37 and 50. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to the dream that I dreamed. They were, there we were, binding sheaves in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, and then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone. And I, where can I turn? Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father, and they said, This we have found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son for many days. Our story continues many years later in chapter 50. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when he heard his brothers speaking. And his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to harm me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as God is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking to them kindly. This, too, is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be God. to God. Amen. It's okay to name it. Joseph wasn't exactly the humblest little brother, and it surely stung his siblings to know deeply that the star that seemed to shine most brightly in Jacob's sky was that same little brother, Joseph. Joseph was, after all, Rachel's son. Remember, Rachel, just like Sarah before her, could not conceive. And so when Jacob was finally born, oh, how Joseph loved him. He is the literal embodiment of the covenantal promise that we heard in Abram's story just last Sunday. 
And as for Joseph, well, he just had to go rubbing it in that he is the favored one in comparison to the rest of the brothers, proclaiming this vision that he had, that his brothers would bow down to him. I don't know too many older siblings who would feel great about hearing such a dream, nor do I know of too many siblings who react kindly to clear parental favoritism. It aches deeply and painfully. It can take a lifetime to reconcile it internally, and that's if reconciling it within one's own spirit is the intentional goal to begin with. So when that is not the goal, what then? Well, murder, apparently, in today's text. Conspiring to kill Joseph the dreamer and let his dreams fall silent in a pit in the wilderness. The oldest, after all, should have been the rightfully respected leader, set to inherit the father's fortunes, so everyone should be bowing down in the other direction, right? The Hebrew word for firstborn son, and the word that means privileges of the firstborn, including that double portion of inheritance, are the same word. Their father's favoritism of the youngest goes against even language itself. Dad's favoritism doesn't sit well emotionally, culturally, or even linguistically. And for the brothers? Well, bowing down to the youngest is just wrong. That Joseph has the audacity to envision the world turned upside down stabs at their preconceived notion of a just world order. Oof, that's a lot to take in in this topsy-turvy tale of dreams and sibling rivalries, inheritance and favoritism, all mixed together in one thick soup. Anyone else out there today feeling a little bit better about their own family squabbles? Perhaps, but I don't think that's the good news of this passage. Yes, over many more years, Joseph rises to the top parlaying his talent for dream interpretation into a place in Pharaoh's court and ultimately being in a position to save his family's life when they come to Egypt as refugees later on. This is good news, to be sure. But if we jump to the end of the story, we miss the good news opportunity while still on the edge of the pit, smack dab in the middle of the story. We've talked about how the brothers may very well have viewed Joseph and their father's favoritism. We've talked about their anger and greed and desire to restore the culturally expected order to their family system by doing away with this favored little one. But then out there, in the middle of the brothers plotting, Reuben speaks. Reuben, the eldest son of Jacob and Leah, the son who stands the most to profit from the hierarchy remaining in place, unchallenged, unchanged by this dreamer, the one who is most heavenly invested in the Bekorah system that favors older children, he who has the greatest cause to be upset by his father's favoritism toward Joseph. And what does Reuben do? Well, the other brothers want to kill Joseph. And here comes Reuben to open his mouth against this plan. Here we think, yes, thank God one of the brothers has come to his senses and is stopping this violence. And Reuben says, let's not take his life. Yep, great, we are with you, Reuben, keep going. Reuben says, shed no blood. Right on, Reuben. This is some good news gospel right here. Shed no blood. Keep it going one more step. Get Joseph out of there safely with you. Get out of this together. Or at the very least, do not leave him and stay by his side. And then Reuben says, just throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him. And then he leaves Joseph alone with his brothers who want to kill him. Oh, Reuben, so close, but no, you've lost us here. This is officially a terrible plan. 
Reuben's grand plan is to buy some time. To tell his brother who is facing the threat of death to wait it out in the pit by himself. He'll come back, he tells himself, and then Joseph can be restored to his father, Jacob, and Reuben himself doesn't have to take on any risk of the brother's anger being directed at him. Sounds a lot like performative allyship, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like a half-hearted call against injustice that still leaves Joseph open to abuse. Good intentions, sure, but Reuben is also making the one experiencing violence keenly aware that he's not willing to put some real skin in the game and stay with him. Reuben doesn't want to end up in that pit, so he steps away with good intentions to come back later when things have calmed down, and by then, it's just too late. The brothers find another way to make Joseph disappear and turn a profit at the same time, 20 pieces of silver. Make a profit off the back of your brother and return home with hands covered in the blood of lies. So where exactly is this good news I mentioned? Where is the goodness in all of this? I'll tell you where I see it plainly. The good news of this difficult story comes when we see ourselves within the story. When we see ourselves and our time and our world through the eyes of Reuben and Jacob and Joseph. And explore what it means in our souls to be people marginalized. To be people witnessing marginalization. To be angry and to be afraid. Here are some possibilities for us to consider about how the good news may be echoing within us as we engage in the middle of this mess. What happens inside of us as we hear about the angry brothers who feel that the rightful order of the world and of their lives is being challenged, an order which they had nothing to do with creating, but were born into all the same? What happens inside of us as we watch what probably felt to them like righteous anger, explode. Confronting our own anger and asking God to help us explore what our anger is really about and how to process that without plotting and pits just might be the good news of the story that we need to listen to today. Or what happens inside of us when we let ourselves actually envision Joseph's terror? Standing at the pit's edge, wondering if this is the moment that he will meet his grave. His own kin were the ones plotting. And he knew they were capable of it after experiencing their brotherly animosity for years. Are we brave enough to see the pit through Joseph's eyes? to stand and try to empathize with his terror and bewilderment, to see and empathize with all who face the grave daily, either in the face of political violence and oppression, or those whose lives, like Joseph's, are treated only as valuable insofar as they are economically productive. What happens inside of us? when we allow ourselves to practice real down-in-the-pit empathy. How might Joseph's experience of that terrifying encounter have shifted if he even knew that Reuben was willing to risk his own place in the family and his own inherited wealth to come, to stay by Joseph's side, or at least to try to speak up to protect him? I think so often we live in this world with Reuben's good intentions, watching as life spins into chaos. We try to find ways to minimize the damage in our mind's eyes and keep ourselves safe at the same time. It seems wise. It seems prudent. It seems advisable. It seems easier. (laughs) But so often good intentions alone aren't enough to stop the chaos. Go figure, hope without action doesn't change things. As DeRay McKesson puts it, hope, 
Hope is the belief that our tomorrows can be better than our todays. Hope is not magic. Hope is work. Maybe we can imagine ourselves in Ruben's shoes. Afraid of what our siblings, what our peers might think of us if we take a stand beside or behind or in front of those experiencing oppression. Perhaps I'm alone in this, but I imagine someone here besides me knows the fear of speaking out against oppression, against subjugation, against marginalization, for fear of upsetting or offending those closest, family members, colleagues, and friends, when they participate in, defend, or justify oppression in the world. But when that fear rises up and the temptation to walk away from the edge of the pit begins to rise in us too, maybe we will pause to also hear that spirit whisper within us, saying to us that Reuben didn't dig deeply enough to stand up directly to his brothers, or that he didn't find the courage to even try talking to them one-on-one -on -one to see if he could bring more brothers alongside what he knew to be right, namely protecting Joseph's life. Instead, he cunningly devised a plan to keep himself completely out of the conflict, while trying to spare his brother from death, which results in neither hoped for. Reuben ultimately is not kept safe by his seemingly safer decision. He ends up in tears, in a kind of pain that lasts and lasts. Tears of grief, tears of shame, tears of regret, tears of deep mourning. Engaging in conflict seems more appealing when we don't really have to engage, when we can find ways to skirt around the edges like Reuben attempts, who among us likes conflict direct and head on? Who among us wouldn't rather find creative solutions to keep someone safe enough? Okay, okay, so he may be in a pit, but he's not totally dead yet. And that way we can live without risk ourselves too, and without real risk to our other relationships. But that still leaves Joseph in a pit without a hope in the world and no one by his side. Let that sink in. Reuben left. Physically, sure, but his departure also leaves Joseph and Jacob and even Reuben himself spiritually in grief and despair. And this story started with grief. And grief begetting anger, and anger begetting grief. What connects this narrative throughout is grief. Grief which runs rampant. Grief which tears us apart. And it doesn't have to be that way. Weeping in isolation. Weeping in a pit, next to a pit, and in the middle of lies delivered with bloody hands from broken brothers. Whose own grief about their father's favoritism fueled the center of their breaking. Friends, we know all about sackcloth and ashes these days. We know what it feels like to mourn and to ache and to hold good intentions alongside fear which keeps us stuck in place. We know what it feels like to fear and be feared, to worry that there is not enough love to cover us all, to worry that there is not enough of so many things. Time, food, compassion, medical care, you name it, we've got to worry about it right about now. So let's take a deep breath in together, here in the messy middle. And remember that there is good news within the transformative power of this difficult story to work within us if we will allow ourselves to empathize with the characters and apply their hard-learned lessons to our contemporary circumstances. Let me start with bees and honey. Hang with me for a moment. I learned that the average bee will produce one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in its entire lifetime. That's a lot of flying, a lot of buzzing, a lot of pollinating for only a few drops of honey. 
It may seem like only one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey is the result of it all, but in truth, that sweetness becomes acres upon acres of new life along the way. Not to mention that economic productivity alone pales in comparison to the true value of a life. Reverend Kara Gilger writes, Cynicism, cynicism tells us that our minuscule one-twelfth of a teaspoon of work does not matter. That our small part will not make a difference. Cynicism loves to whisper to the ego that you cannot make a difference. But cynicism is a liar. Honey and anything truly sweet is made by many of us working away in our small, often unseen ways. To be a small part of a large work in the world requires hope in the face of cynicism. It requires seeing the world not as it is, but as it could be. Hope is work. It is work to maintain the imagination it takes to bring mercy into the world. Like a bee, it is work to turn what is beautiful into what can nourish us. But it is not our work alone. And when we do it together, it is a small miracle. So perhaps the good news within the middle of this story is that we are in the middle of our story too. And we are in this messy middle together. And we have the holy opportunity to rewrite the narrative as many times as it takes until no one is in the pit, no one is left to fend for themselves alone, and no one's hands are bloody, and no one is covering themselves with ashes, spilling over with grief. So today and for the week ahead, I ask you to consider when you look in our community and throughout this world today, who is it that you can so plainly see standing near the edge of the pit, pushed into the wilderness and shoved to the margins, left there alone with our distant good intentions? Who do you see and who do you long to stand alongside with more than Reuben's good intentions? Perhaps you can so clearly see those who are poor everywhere, Or maybe you instantly think of our food insecure neighbors, or those being persecuted for their faith, or those in our community who are recovering from COVID and just starting to receive medical bills that will sink them even more than before. Those holding eviction notices in their hands. Who do you see standing at the edge? Breonna Taylor's mother? The good news is that in the story we are writing together, Reuben doesn't have to keep holding his good intentions at a safe distance. As we live, we can choose to rewrite the narrative. Maybe it ends with two in the pit. It isn't a story guaranteed to be safe, but it is a story which will be ultimately lived out alongside the growing mercy of a dreamer who will not let go of the dream that God gave him to live. So, we can choose to be grievers in this, our story. We can choose to be the ones wielding anger with our siblings, enraged, adding fuel to that fire, trading each other for silver and a higher place in this world. Or we can choose a harder path, the path of hope that gets to work and hope that risks some skin in the game. We need not wait until the morning, standing next to the proverbial pit, clinging to abstract hope with Reuben. Hope is a practice. Hope is a practice, so practice we must. Something is not right in our hive will take all of the bees buzzing together to make the honey sweet and to make sweetness enough until all are truly satisfied. So in the name of the God whose story unfolds even through the 12 sons of Jacob, in the name of the God who is not finished with our story, may we work toward that 12th of a teaspoon of sweetness. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.
heavens are whiteness in God's mercy, like the whiteness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. There is no place where earth's failings have such kindly judgment given. For the love of God is broader than the measures of the mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more faithful, we would gladly trust God's word, and our lives reflect thanksgiving for the goodness of our Lord. Let us pray. Living God, as we reflect on stories like that of Joseph and his brothers, we know what it's like to be part of a family, a biological family, a faith family, this larger human family that you have given us. We understand pride and resentment, rivalry and reconciliation. We know the sense of achievement, feelings of disappointment, we know the highs and lows of life together, the joys and celebrations, the anxieties and sorrows. We bring them all to you, and we give you thanks for your presence through it all. We do thank you, O oh God, that at root we share a kinship with all people. We come from different perspectives, but we're part of one human family. Today, some of us can identify with Joseph being in a pit of despair, and some of us can relate to feeling that bitter animosity that would cast aside or ignore a sibling. Or we can relate to feelings of being cast aside or ignored. Some of us wait for our desperate cries or those of others to be heard. Some of us wait in silence with our pain and are wondering. Most of us have grown weary, God, so weary, weary of pandemic, weary of political tension, weary of persistent injustice, weary of personal turmoil, we're weary of natural disasters, and weary of feeling cut off from meeting and embracing those dear to us. We're weary of being out of our routine. So we thank you, O oh God, that you do not grow tired, that in and through all of this, your divine purpose is indeed at work. God, even as we thank you that your love abides and that there are those who know and trust that what others meant for evil, you can use for good. We know that the fruit of your spirit and your will being done and your kingdom coming on earth like in heaven can seem so far from being realized. We pray today for our nation and its leaders. In a time of enormous stress, we pray that cooler and saner heads prevail beyond spin doctoring and carefully stoked outraged and machinations. Bring us to lives and laws and practices and actions that are truly centered in justice for all, with malice towards none. We pray for the eyes and hearts to see where some people are treated as less than others. We pray for the will to do what we can to make a difference for the weightier matters of justice. Pray for the people of Louisville and the fire-ravaged West, for those whose homes and lives have been inundated by floodwaters. We pray for this whole hurting world, O oh God, especially those areas and those people whose names and conditions we bring before you now. 
We pray especially for those who face persecution and threat for their spiritual convictions. We lift up all those who grieve today that they would be able to sense the consolation of your love. We pray for all those whose bodies, minds, or spirits are ailing, that they would experience healing that comes from you. We pray for those who cannot find the words or the will to pray for those they consider enemies, to embrace the compassion that arises from you. We pray today using the words that Jesus taught, Recognizing as we do, no one name fully sums up who you are. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Please join me now for the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. We give you thanks for all that we have received, for the knowledge that you work through imperfect people like us, and for the privilege of being part of embodying your love in the world. Use us and our gifts to your service. We ask them in the name of Jesus, your Son. Tell the story, tis pleasant to 
Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to give it like a rest. And when in scenes of story will be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love. Honeybees can flap their wings up to 200 times a second and can fly up to 20 miles per hour. Something tells me it feels like a lot of work to get to that one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. But that's the thing. Hope is work. Hope is work. And it is good and holy work that we, by the grace of God, get to do together. So in the name of the spirit of the living God, the God who is love, the God who calls us to love and serve. May we go out to do the work of hope together.